We're going to be in 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. 1 John 2, 7 through 11. And I'm going to read it. We'll pray and then we'll get into the text. So 1 John 2, 7 through 11. He says this, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Let's pray. Lord, this is your word and we want to place ourselves under the authority of your word. And we want to receive with faith the things that you speak to us out of the text here. We, we trust that your Holy Spirit wants to minister these things to us in a powerful way. And so we open up our minds and our hearts to your work in us. Lord, you know where we've uh, come from this week, the experiences that we've had. And Lord, you know how much we need you how desperate we are for your work in our lives. And so, Lord, as we look at this text, would you, by your Spirit, just convict us of the things that we need conviction, the where we need just guidance and instruction and righteousness. We pray that you would accomplish that in us. Lord, be the one that speaks into our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So, John wrote this letter, and we don't know exactly the um, context for it all, but we know that there was some false teachers at this time that were really threatening this church. John, in his letter, he writes a couple of times about those who are false prophets or the Antichrist. It would seem like he was addressing some, some Gnostic philosophy that existed uh, as a threat to the church in the first century. And one of the things that the uh, false prophets were saying was that, you know, we have discovered the real truth. We have a, a higher truth, a, an anointing that you normal Christians don't have. Gnosticism is kind of a, um, a dualism, uh, is kind of the heading that it would fall under uh, for uh, a philosophical heading. Kind of like um, this, the same, dualism is kind of seen in Star Wars, where you have kind of light, the, uh, the force, right? The good force versus the darkness, you know? And that's the same idea of what John was facing here. There was those who are claiming to have kind of this anointing and an inner revelation that was special. And they were causing the church to feel really... Um, condemned or insecure in their relationship with the Lord, um, disenfranchised in their relationship with God, um, less spiritual. Uh, there were all kinds of ramifications of this false teaching. It left people feeling just kind of um, maybe like they were on the outside. And I don't know about you and your experience with Christianity, but it, it, it's very, we're very susceptible to um, getting pushed around and feeling insecure in our relationship with God. I think more often than not, it's easy to become condemned or to question your, your salvation or to feel like, am I really saved? And John here in this text, what he's doing is he's trying to encourage these believers to really feel assured of their salvation, to really feel like, look, you have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and you are secure in your relationship with him and you do not need to be influenced or pushed around by these false prophets. And so the epistle of John has these reoccurring themes. It's almost like there's this backbone that goes through the text of just knowing that you're a believer and what it means to be a genuine, true Christian. And in these verses, verses 7 through 11, 
John is really addressing two things. There's a repetition here in the text. One is this issue of love. Love as an old commandment and love as a new commandment. And then in verses 9 through 11, we have this whole issue of light and darkness. What is light and darkness? And so let's look at these. I want to just pull out a couple of observations from the text this morning. And if, if you're not one who's yet committed yourself to the Lord, I think that as you look at this text, you'll f- be surprised. If you if you're, wouldn't call yourself a Christian yet, you'll be surprised by some of the things that this text asserts. And it may cause you to step back and reconsider Christianity because it, you'll find that you're on the same Uh, playing field as what this text is saying. The first thing that John writes here is that he's not writing a new commandment. He says, brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but a commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. So an old command what is this command? Well, what we see is, is he's talking about love. And he's saying that, look, this is, this is an old command. Now, you looking at this text, I'm sure if you're, you've been a believer for any number of years, you've seen that this, this text. And it seems like he's doing a, um, some double speak here. On one hand, he says, this is an old commandment. And then in the very next set of verses, he says, now this is a brand new commandment. And so let's ask the question very quickly, why is this an old command, and then why is love a new command, and how can we assert both at the same time? Well, John says the same thing in his uh, second epistle, in 2 John 5, he says, and now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning that we love one another. There it's explicitly laid out in 2 John 5 that this is not a new commandment. This is the one we've had from the beginning that we should love one another. And then in uh, the next chapter, 1 John 3, 1 John 3, it says this in verse 11. For this is the message that you've had from the beginning, that we should love one another. This is the message or the command that we've had from the beginning, that we should love one another. And so the command to love is an old command. It's old in this sense. There's a couple of aspects where he may be saying that love is an old command. First of all, if we look at just some anthropological studies that have been done, what we'll find from societies all around the world, ancient and current, is that love is an agreed-upon ethic. There are not very many cultures that believe love is unimportant or been outmoded by some other ethic. If you study ethics as a, uh, just from a secular point of view, what you'll find is that all around the world, People value love. In fact, there's one ethical system called situationism which believes that love is the chief ethic. Every other aspect of ethics is relative. The only kind of fixed absolute is the absolute of love. And so in that sense, John could be saying that love is an old command. It's historic. It's universal. But he could also be saying, he could be uh, pulling from the Old Testament. Leviticus 19.8, it says there that to love your neighbor as yourself. And so we can go to the Old Testament, back thousands of years into Jewish history, and we can see that God was commanding his people to love their neighbor. And so in that sense, in terms of, of Christian history or the development of Christian doctrine, love is a historic or an old command. But it also could be that it was a command they had received as new believers. 
maybe many years earlier. I was noticing on the chairs when I came in, you have a, a foundations class that's going to be starting on November 2nd. So that's for those of you that maybe you um, are new to the faith. And the church has been doing foundations classes uh, since the first century. It was called catechesis. It was a, uh, a process of, of taking a new believer through just the fundamentals of the faith. Uh, to catechize someone, maybe you've come from the Catholic Church or a, a different do- denomination, and, and that word has a, a familiar ring to it. It simply means to train somebody in the basics, to catechize them, is to kind of get them up to speed with what are the fundamentals or the foundational beliefs. And no doubt, for these Christians who John was writing to, love was one of those foundational beliefs that had been communicated to them. And so that may be the reason why John is saying this is an old command. To love is an old command. He says, this isn't a new commandment I'm writing to you, but love is a new commandment which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. So whether it's an appeal to the universal nature of love or the fact that love is found as an Old Testament command or it was a part of the early instructions that they believed as a new believer, we can look at love as a command and say, this is something you are totally familiar with. This is something that you know. So what are the implications of love being an old command? First, we see that a precedent has been set for this being a fundamental value. Precedent is a, a, a legal term. It kind of goes, it harkens back, especially, you know, for us in, in the United States that are familiar with a United States legal system, you hear the term precedent, it means that um, a standard has been set. Uh, if there's a precedent, then there's no real need for a justice to kind of rewrite um, or, or readdress a legal issue. They have precedent that they can go back to. And that's the case with love. As love being an old commandment, there's precedent to be loving. There's no aspect of of this command for you and I to be loving where it's kind of like new territory. No, there's precedent. It's historic and it's original. Now, sometimes maybe you watch a commercial and and you'll see, I guess the thing that comes to mind is like... um, on maybe a, a Gap commercial for Gap clothing. They say when the company was founded. Or maybe it's a, um, a hardware company, and they'll say, you know, we were founded in 1850. Well, why do they say that? Why do they add that into their advertisement? Well, they're trying to establish the historic nature of their company, that they've been around for a long time that they are really have the market corner. They were the first ones. And so when John says to you and I and to these new believers that love is an old command, there should be a sense of like, you know, we're not rewriting the book. This is something that has, um, there's a great lineage behind it. When you and I are loving to our neighbor, when we're loving to our spouse, when we're loving to our kids, we are doing something that is historic that has a strong foundation. We're carrying on a rich tradition of love. Now, why was this important at this time in the church? Well, there was these spiritual Christians that were actually false prophets that had come in, and they were trying to position themselves as being the most spiritual the uh, really the ones who had Christianity, the market cornered. And John here is saying, no, this metric of love is an old command, it's going to be a new command, and this is going to be what we are able to evaluate true spirituality off of. This is going to be the metric, the instrument that we use to determine what is a true Christian. 
you are maybe familiar with, uh, maybe some of you have like a, uh, well, most industries have some type of metric for evaluation. Like for me, I do a lot of teaching in the classroom. And what I do for my class is I'll have an entrance exam. Students will come in, and the, the exam counts for nothing. It just shows me, here's where everybody's at when we start off. Here's the starting point in terms of their familiarity with the topic. And so they'll kind of go through, and they'll tell me, you know, yes, I understand what this word means, or no, I don't, and here's what else I've read on this topic. And it, it kind of gives me a baseline in order to know where they're at. And then at the end of the semester, we take another test, and I'm able to evaluate, okay, how much have they grown over this last 16 months of Bible college or whatever school it is that I'm teaching it? The same is the case for John here. He's saying, look, we have this metric as Christians where we can examine, right? right? We can examine ourselves. We can examine others. Is there a genuine love being displayed in the lives of these people who claim to be Christians? So love is historic. It's this old command. But then he says in verse 8, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. A new commandment. So it's both an old command and a new command. So let's consider just for a second, why is love a new command? How does that old command become new? Now, you've been looking at this. In John 13, I'm sure just in the past maybe couple of months, you looked at John 13. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus telling his disciples, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. You see, this word that John here is using for new, it means new in nature, different from the usual, impressive, better than the old, superior in value or attraction. Here's kind of how we would use this word in our day for new. How many of you have gotten the new iPhone 6, the new iPhone? Not many of you. I haven't either. Now, when the iPhone 6 came out, that iPhone, it wasn't the first time anybody had ever created a phone. It wasn't the first time anybody had created a smartphone. And it wasn't the first time the iPhone had actually been created, but yet we call it the new iPhone. That's what this idea of new means here in our text. It's a new command. Jesus tells his disciples, I'm giving to you a new commandment that you love one another. This same Greek word is used in Hebrews chapter 10 when the writer of Hebrews is talking about um, the new way that we relate to God. He says in Hebrews 10, 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is to say, through his flesh. You see, there was a way that existed to relate to God, but the writer of Hebrews is saying the way that we, now under the new covenant, relate to God, there's a newness about it. It's not that God was not approachable in the past, but the way that God was approachable has become old. And the new way of approaching God has become new because Jesus, through the death on his cross, has inaugurated a new and a living way. 2 Corinthians 5.17 also uses this word about being new. It says this in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. 
Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, before you came to Christ, you were a creation. You were a created being. But he says, when you come to Christ, you have become a new creation. There's a newness about you. Now, here's what I want you to latch on to. The theme in the New Testament and the New Covenant, where things become new, they become new because of a person. They become new because of Jesus Christ. The way to God is new. It's new and living because Jesus has inaugurated that way. We are a new creation because of what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. And love is a new commandment because of him. Look back in the text there in verse 8. Do you see it says, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him. It's true in him. Love is a new command, be, command because it's true in him. Jesus makes the command to love new. It is truly new when it is discovered in Christ. And we also see in the text there, in verse 9, it's new as the darkness is passing away. And why is the darkness passing away? It's because the light of God has come into the world. Jesus has come into the world as the light of God, and it's lighting the world. It's lighting all men, it says in John. And as that's taking place, love becomes new. Love becomes new. The command to love is made new. It has a new nature, different from the old. It is impressive, better than the old, superior in value and attraction through an, an encounter with Jesus. It is a real and relevant today. It is as real and relevant today as it was in Leviticus. There's a vibrancy about it. The command to love is alive. If there was a magazine for character qualities that came out monthly, love would be on the cover every month because to be loving never goes out of style. Yeah, it's an old command. Yeah, it's got, it has a great heritage. When you and I are loving, we're doing something that just harkens back to the garden. But it is new in Christ. It is relevant for today. To be a loving person is not something that was cool in the 80s. It is as relevant today as it was back then. It's interesting the way that it becomes new is by association. This is, it's made it new by association with Christ. Now, you may be familiar with this idea of making something credible by association if you've watched any number of commercials. Most recently, the example that comes to mind is, is Buick. Now, Buick, as I was growing up, that was the vehicle kind of of a past generation, now, if you own a Buick, I'm not saying that you're old, but look, it had this identity with kind of a past generation, and Buick was aware of that. And so recently they decided in order to make their vehicle back in vogue, they needed to associate their brand with a modern day uh, star. And who did they pull? Matthew McConaughey, right? Now, Matthew McConaughey is not cool because he hearkens from a past generation. He is in vogue today. And so they're trying to make their brand credible through association. And that's the reality about love. Love is credible. It is vibrant. It is cool because of its association with Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ has made love as relevant today as it's ever been uh, because of just associating it with Jesus. It remains, it remains a real metric for evaluating the spiritual condition of an individual. It would be easy maybe for these false prophets to come in and say, 
Love, you know, oh, you know, everybody knows about love. You learned about that in, you know, first grade. You learned about that back in your foundations class. We want to teach you the things that are, you know, the deeper life, the things that are really, really kind of makes you stand out as a Christian. Those might have been the lines that these false prophets used. But here, John the Apostle is saying, no, love is both a historic command and it is as relevant today as it was back when you first heard about it. Let's look at this last interesting set of statements that John makes about spiritual darkness. Spiritual darkness. He's going to talk about the reality of spiritual darkness in a world with a lot of physical light. First of all, he says, if you say that you're in the light, but you hate your brother, then you're really in the darkness. If you love your brother, then you are living in the light. And third, if you hate your brother, you are in darkness, walk in darkness, and can't see because of the darkness. This is where John begins to make statements that are not obvious to a person who uh, is not a Christian. He's making state metaphysical statements, statements about darkness existing in a world that's full of light. In fact, to agree here with what um, John is saying, you have to take a bit of a leap. You have to trust that there's a spiritual realm. And again, if you're not a, a believer coming in this morning, you haven't accepted Christianity as your own faith, then these statements may rub you the wrong way. The, the assertion that there is such a thing as spiritual darkness may be a bit troubling to you. But let's look at this. He says, he, he is saying that those who want to claim that they are in the light, these false prophets, those who are claiming that they are in the light and enlightened, they are not truly in the light if they're not living the life of love. They, have made some, they may have said something like, I am a spiritually enlightened person. I have perception into the things of God. God and me, we're, we're good. I don't have anything to worry about. You see, these false prophets may have claimed to have had the true light or the enlightenment of God. But John's saying, no, no. If you are hating your brother, then you're truly in darkness. We may ask the question, is spiritual darkness real? And John says that hatred towards your brother is a proof of spiritual darkness. This reminds me of one of my favorite Christian movies, The Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> now, if you think for a second... I know that I just turned that on its head. But here's the thing. I really believe that probably a Christian wrote that. If you remember the plot line, there's this group of pirates that are cursed because of an original sin. And their curse was not apparent to others until they stood in the light of the moon. And once they did stand in the light of the moon, it was very clear that these were actually, they were dressed skeletons. But they themselves had become aware, they'd become aware of their condition when they attempted to indulge in the pleasures of the world. There's this famous line from the chief pirate, Barbosa. He says this, rich men we were. And we spent it and traded it and gave it away in exchange for drink and food and pleasant company. But we found out the drink could not sate us and the food turned to ash in our mouths and no amount of pleasant company could ease our torment. Arg, right? <laughs> See, the interesting thing that's displayed through that movie is that these men were cursed and they knew their condition. But it was only when they stood in the light of the moon that others could see their condition. Here's the thing, though. They knew they were cursed because when they tried to eat food and enjoy it, it turned to ash 
in their mouth. When they tried to indulge in the pleasures of this world, everything was empty. And the question that the text begs of us this morning is, do you know your true spiritual condition? There were these men that came into the church who said, oh, we're full of light. We know exactly how we're doing spiritually. And John says, no, no, no. If you hate your brother, then you are walking in darkness. Now, does this mean that spiritual darkness or walking in spiritual darkness means that one could lose their salvation? Walking in darkness is not equivalent to the loss of salvation. Now, anyone that does not know Christ is walking in darkness. But I'm not sure about you, but I have, as a believer, not fully loved all my brothers at every waking moment. I've caught myself lacking love. And I don't think that what John's saying is that you've lost your salvation at that point, but what he is saying is that you're walking in darkness. You're not walking in the light that God wants to provide for your life. You're not, your life is not illumined for Christ. You're not a city on a hill witnessing to Christ. You're walking in darkness. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you've lost your salvation, but it does mean that there is an absence of God's light being allowed to permeate your life. And so this metric of love, this call to love, it's, it's an interesting thing. Now, it is easy to hear and read a text about love and feel like, oh, I don't know. I'm so familiar. Does familiarity breed contempt? There's three things, three steps here in this text that we as believers can walk through. But this is for those of you who may be here and not know Christ, or you want to take this text and share this text with somebody that has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, let me take you through three steps in this text that are pretty convincing or really kind of want to draw you in to maybe consider Christianity more. First of all, this text asserts that love is right and hate is wrong. You can look at this text and you can see very clearly that God is affirming that love is right and that hate is wrong. There's a thread in this text that starts back in the garden. Genesis 1. God created a helpmate for Adam and sanctioned marriage. God created a loving relationship between mankind and Uh, and himself when he created the world. It may be easy for us as Christians to feel like the command to love is old and old hat, maybe something that was cool back in the 80s, but kind of, you know, it's lost its shine now. But I'll tell you something. Not one of you came in today feeling like being loved was something cool in the 80s. Every one of us want to be loved And we know that it is absolutely natural to be loved, and it is absolutely unnatural to be the object of hate. We've all been on the receiving end of love or hate. It's very real. And if you're not a Christian, you may not be ready to accept that you're spiritually blind, but you do have to find Christianity more attractive as it asserts something that you hold to be fundamental, and that is that love is right, and hate is wrong. The second thing that this text affirms is that hypocrisy exists, and the Bible is at war with it. You see, Christians so often are accused of being hypocrites, and many times people who are not yet ready to give their life to Christ will point at Christians and say, there's so much hypocrisy in the church, therefore, I don't want to become a Christian. Hypocrisy is the act of causing people to believe that you are good when you're really doing something that's wrong. It's like being an actor, pretending to be something that doesn't actually reflect an internal reality. And here again, the Bible is on the side of that non-believer 
who's upset at hypocrisy. The Bible is over here with the non-believer saying hypocrisy is wrong. It's calling the kettle black. But it isn't, the, it, this text isn't saying change your behavior. It's saying that a genuine, authentic life is one that has discovered that Jesus is the source of life and light. The life that evidences light is sourced in a relationship with Christ. You see, Christians can be hypocritical. We can fall into walking in darkness and hating our brother. But the Bible doesn't give us any excuses. Instead, it says, no, that's wrong. And so if, if Christianity is something new to you or you're considering it, then you have to appreciate the fact that the Bible is calling the kettle black and saying that hypocrisy is inexcusable. And with that metric, that instrument of evaluating true light and darkness, love, the need for love, and the exercise of love indicates a true walk with God. The third step here is that Jesus wants to deliver you from darkness. Do you see at the end of verse 11, as it talks about darkness, it says, but he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because darkness has blinded his eyes. He's describing somebody that just feels disillusioned and doesn't know where he's going. And again, if you don't know Christ, then you may be able to really cozy up to that verse. You may feel like you're like that ship that's right now off the coast of British Columbia without a power source, drifting in the water, without the ability to know where it's going and where, what's going to happen next. Maybe that is like you. And the good news from this text is that God wants to be the light of your life. He wants to give you purpose. He wants to give you direction. And it is all contingent upon a relationship with Christ. Jesus wants to deliver you and I from a lifestyle of darkness, a walk in darkness. And he wants it to be the case so that we're not people that are blinded, we're not people that don't know where we're going. We're people that have clarity and direction in our life. And so, for those of us who are believers, we look at this text and there should be a heart check. Lord, am I walking in the light? Am I loving today as if it was a brand new concept, as new as the iPhone 6? And if you're a non-believer then you've got to look at this text and you've got to see that the God who wrote this Bible knows you in who you are in a very natural way. And he is saying the things that are the cries of your heart, that love is natural, that hate is unnatural, and that you are created with a purpose, that you're given direction, and that there's no place for hypocrisy in our lives that we're called to be a genuinely true people.